Go to there. Okay. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is uh, the second of a, a series of talks to um, designed to bring outside perspectives to our PhD students. Um, this is a lecture series, is, is one of many activities uh, of McCormick's Art and Engineering Initiative. Uh, for example, I myself have taught uh, almost half a dozen now classes uh, between artists here at Northwestern and, um, and engineers in particular myself. Uh, one, of, one of those classes is dat Data as Art uh, out of Siegel. Another is uh, between Art Theory and Practice and McCormick. And there, for those of you who are interested, there'll be uh, another episode of that class this coming spring. Uh, it'll be co-taught by myself and Inigo Manglano Oval, and it promises to be as, as fun and exciting as, as prior uh, classes. So today we host uh, Dar Dario Robledo, uh, who is an artist from Houston, Texas, and who is the current artist at large in a new program uh, between uh, McCormick and the Block Museum of Art. And as part of this appointment, he is working with faculty across campus to explore connections between art and science. Um, Dario lives in Houston, Texas, and he has had many solo exhibits since 1997. He has served as visit visiting artist and lecturer at a number of universities, including Bard College, MIT, RISD, and the Hubble Space Telescope Institute. Uh, Darrow's work, as you'll see, is born out of cross-disciplinary research and collaboration, working across sculpture, installation, and sound to explore the intersections of music, popular culture, language, storytelling, and the histories of science and war. Uh, so as part of this project, I've had the opportunity to have a few one-on-ones with Darrow, and I have to say uh, I'm really excited to, to see his talk today. Um, he is a person of unbounded curiosity and great creativity. And I, th I think you're going to learn a lot. All right. Welcome, Derek. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Um, thank you, Malcolm, for that. And as, as he mentioned, which I don't know if everybody's aware of the program, but uh, with McCormick and The Block, I'm the artist at large is the, is the title I've been given, which I, I wear very proudly. I've, Usually it's artist in residence, but I like artist at large too. It, I think it encompasses more the possibilities of uh, my own interest as far as cross-disciplinary thinking. So I understand that you're all PhD students, and um, that's great. <laughs> I'm excited to talk to you and sort of build off, I'm assuming most of you were at the previous lecture with the dean, and, and I watched it, and it was great, and I hope I can build off of that thinking and I, I also feel really honored that the Block and McCormick would, would put me in the camp of such thinkers of this cross-disciplinary, or I say transdisciplinary thinking, and to really make the case as to why. Uh, and this is a bigger, big question to me because, of course, on paper, we can give lip service to the idea of cross-disciplinary thinking but that's, that's just not enough for me. That's not the harder problem. The harder problem is what happens when you collaborate in such a way that both fields change in the process. And it's a very difficult problem. And today I want to show you some examples of the way I try to answer that in my own work. Uh, so, so for example, you know, what does a contemporary artist have to say about artificial heart design? And it's just a, it's an odd question to have asked in the first place because we seem so far apart on not only our methods, but our, our expected outcomes. But to me, that's what's interesting, is to try to find the answer to such a question. Uh, so I, wanna, I wanted to show you a few examples of that today. Everything good? OK. Uh, and so this idea of, I don't want to presume your knowledge of art or what artists do, uh, so forgive me if I, if I seem a little rudimentary, but I've, I've learned that the perception of the artist and culture is often locked back in a very outdated 19th century romantic notion, the struggling, uh, almost always male, lone genius uh, that is driven by inspiration and instinct and emotion rather than, where, which I, I, there's some truth to all of that, of course. But the type of artist, 
that I believe that I am and the type of art that I advocate for is the type that made the first brains that made images on a cave wall. And as much as I love science and engineering, it's a few centuries old. As of today, the oldest cave paintings are dated over 40,000 years. And so for the human mind to start to try to make sense of the world around it, uh, and those cave paintings to me is a form of knowledge production, a form of investigation of, in the world. So I say all that and I put up a few uh, things here just to give you a broader sense of the ways artists can work today. Uh, so there's a, there's a term you may be aware of in the arts, it's called res a research-based practice. It's a more recent development in the arts and it's a, it's a complicated term because of course the re word research would be incredibly relevant, I'm sure, to all of what you do in your own, in your own work but it's not always immediately given that an artist does that as well. And so I wanna show, again, some examples of how that's relevant in my own practice and what, and then ask questions like, how does an artist's research methodology differ or is it similar to yours, for example? Um, and here, so here, so part of my, my uh, life as an artist is I, I do things like this, which I'm so, proud of your school, I just have to tell you how this is not easy work and to create a space for an artist to do this is highly unusual. And just want to applaud the Dean and McCormick and my colleague Susie who, uh, at the block as well and, and Malcolm is the epitome of that as well to me, um, these kinds of broad, broadly curious th thinking. So he, I'm going to just wanted to show you that as a model of an artist moving through research institutions in the role of scholar or researcher is maybe a new concept to you or not. Again, I don't know, but in the arts, it's fairly new and the infrastructure to allow for it is still being built and you should be really proud that your school is, is doing that. Um, so I, wanna, I, I wanted to put up this slide because I, I wanted to spend a little time just unpacking a little more how I think uh, I, I want today to be as much about unfolding a line of thinking as it is about any one project. And I wanted, I've spent a lot of time thinking about over the years, you know, what is, if I had to put my finger on one thing that unites us across disciplines as far as science and art, and we have diverged in very interesting ways, uh, but I, part of this program and my effort is to circle back together again. And if I had to put my finger on that one thing, it's, that we're both at some level in the business of increasing the sensitivity of our observations. And that can mean you know, different things um, for, let's say, Patsy Cline, uh, who's one of my, my archetypes of, a, of one of our great artists, uh, as well as the Large Hadron Collider, probing um, the particles that give mass to everything. So I like to be playful in the way I ask these questions, like how can an artist become a living Hubble telescope, an emoting Large Hadron Collider? How can a scientist become the Emily Dickinson of data or the Patsy Cline of experiment design? And I, I point this out too for another important thing that I, I think is important and I would like to challenge you on, is that I don't place a hierarchy on either forms of these investigations of experience. What physicists are doing incredible, un, un, hopefully unlocking the reality of the fabric of existence. But what Patsy Cline and Billie Holiday and Da Vinci and any a number of other artists are doing and have done and will continue to do, to me I don't place this on a hierarchy of knowledge. These are both investigations into lived experience and I'd, I'd like to challenge you on that as thinkers too that um, that we do this thing where we put art over here. In my experience, it's usually down here and all the other disciplines sort of rank up higher. And I, I want to minimum balance that out and, and argue to you why we should. Um, so as over the years, I've developed different strategies on, on what my model of an artist is. Here's a, uh, I won't go over all these of course, but I'm gonna highlight a few projects that pulls out themes in each of these. <clears throat> 
So for example, I'm a very big believer that uh, like an like a investigative journalist or a war journalist, that artists can act like embedded observers in other fields, observing, of course, uh, and artists can take that in a number of ways. For me, that's often about reclaiming the humanity or the emotional dimension of groundbreaking science. Uh, you know, Carl Sagan's one of our great examples of someone who could merge both, of how can you look into the cosmos and not feel something. And often the feeling part doesn't get the same level playing field or of importance in the estimation of the whole, uh, in this quest to understand reality. And I feel that part of my job as an artist is to observe other fields and to make this case that sometimes an idea is just so big that it transcends its field of origin. And I would argue that you probably can't really understand that thing unless you bring into it other aspects of understanding, art being one of them. Um, so another thing I'll point out today is I'm really big on the idea of an artist as a cultural critic, critic but using the tools of poetry to be that critic. And, I, and I'll, again, I'll show you some examples of that in a second. So before I, before I move into the work, I just one, one last thing I wanted to say is, um, I mentioned earlier, is like, why? Why, why should we do this work? Because um, we all can be happy, content, in our very rarefied, siloed type of thinking. And I get it, specialization requires that. But I just want to poke at you a little to, to be conscious of that and to counter it. Because I think, at least my estimation as an artist, is it's my obligation to be broadly curious. And in many ways, that's why I chose art. Because for me, art is this umbrella term for someone who could not pick a passion and decided to just pick them all. And art gives me the flexibility to investigate them all with the hope that they're going to challenge and complicate each other through the crossover. So I think as the thinkers that you are and the lives you have ahead in your field, as I'm sure you're here partly for passion or else you know, it seems like uh, to get to a PhD level, you need that, something you're gonna commit your life to. And the knowledge, the road of knowledge is going to keep pushing you down further, further that rarefied field. But I, I just want to argue and poke you to, to be conscious and push back because siloed thinking really does need to be challenged, um, especially with the type of problems we have ahead in, uh, currently, but also in uh, the years to come. Um, so yeah, I just want to say that, that I want to, I want to challenge you. Do you have an obligation? to knowledge itself, whatever the specific knowledge you're pursuing. And I, at least for myself as an artist, I firmly say I have an obligation to all of it. Whatever the complications that come with that, I have an obligation to it all. So I'm going to try to be ambitious uh, and show you some of what I, in my own work, the ambition of it. I don't know that I can get to all this today, but I'm, I'm going to try. Uh, I'm very curious about how we know things, of course, and in particular, the heart, the brain, and the cosmos. And the work I've done in these fields has gone in different ways, but what has always anchored me has been this uh, sort of poetic playfulness on what does it mean to find a signal of life. And you know, think of a waveform on a heart monitor, or the search for life in the universe, if that signal comes, comes in one day, what's it gonna look or sound like? I'm very interested in, in that dynamic of it. So I wanna, hopefully I'm gonna try to touch on some projects that have uh, investigated these three topics through that lens. And again, one thing I wanted to mention again is I'm gonna, I'm kind of play, putting on the table the way I think as much as what I make out of it. And so, Instead, uh, I hope you will have patience as I unwrap a story because that's as much of my work, again, as any object I make. And for the, in the spirit of learning how we think as much as the end result, 
I'm going to unpack it a little in a little more detail. So I hope that it will I interest you. So I wanted to begin with this long fascination I've had with the human heart. And this, this image just taken a few years ago, this image could never have been taken until a few years ago because of the technologies that both of these objects represent. And I have spent so much time meditating on the ramifications of these two objects. And I, don't, I hope I'm getting somewhere with it, but there's a deep question here. And what you're looking at is uh, an older model of an artificial heart on the left. Uh, it's advanced quite a bit since that stage. And on the right is the latest, uh, what's called a ghost heart. Uh, this is the quest to build a heart from scratch, build it up, uh, rather that would supplant the need for a mechanical heart. But what's driving both of these, as I'm sure you know, is, is health. It's the desire uh, to hit, mend broken hearts. And it's a fascinating story of the human quest to know our hearts. And think of the playfulness in that language about art in many ways has spent millennia searching for such things about knowledge of the heart. And I'm fascinated with what science has contributed. But here's the point about the cultural critic thing. These technologies, as incredible as they are and as, and as many lives as they have and may save in the future, there are other deeper question, cultural questions that, I need to, that need to be asked as well. And so I want to unpack that a little bit for you. <clears throat> so for example, um, the first time an artificial heart was ever implanted in a human in uh, the late 60s, uh, Mr. Karp was the first to have this heart. It's a, cr a crazy, ethically questionable, uh, radical story of science. And it was a threshold that we crossed that I would argue was not just about technology. It was about science, this rarefied moments in science when science asks us to put back on the table some uh, definition of life that nobody thought was up for redefinition. One of those being that to be alive means you have a beating heart, an organic beating heart. For science to cross the line and the threshold of putting a fully mechanical heart in a human raised a host of complicated cultural problems that we have all kind of forgotten about now, but I, I have not forgotten because that lineage continues and it continues to get poked at about definitions of life. Um, and this is a, an incredible story of the design of these hearts. And it's a rare case where design is evolving based on the death of a previous patient. And think of in the history of design, how many histories of design can say such a thing? That each time it's tweaked, it's because someone previously died, because it didn't work. It's also a beautiful visual history of, of thinking. So it's not, again, it's motivated to save life, but it's also doing something I argue is very radical, which is taking off the table the idea of an organic heart as somehow crucial to how one defines their humanity. And so, the two, the two ideas on, on this point I want to leave you with are uh, two game-changing ideas just in the past five years that I would argue are now pushing us further into complicated territory that the arts, I think, should collaborate with science on to sort through. And the first game-changing idea is that the, the, the doctors who've been working on that artificial heart, uh, many of them have come to the conclusion that the reason we can't solve it because, by the way, for 60 years, we haven't really solved the problem in the sense that someone can live long term with an artificial heart. And the reason is because, at least the doctor I'm going to tell you about, is he thinks we've been doing, we've been making a big mistake, which is we've been trying to mimic nature. And as he, the metaphor he often brings up is flying. He's, when we first tried to fly, what did we do? We tried to flap our wings and quickly realized that's not going to work, which led to the invention of fixed aerodynamics. And he's arguing we're at a similar point with the heart. He's saying something groundbreaking, which is the reason we can't solve the problem of the, artificial, of the heart is because we can't seem to let go of the need for pulsatility, <laughs> for the beating. So he's arguing if we could let go of the beating and start over, 
we may be able to solve this. And the, it's a very old idea, of the Archimedes screw, and the technology, instead of pumping blood through your body, it's in a continuous flow. But here are the side effects of this device. These are the, the two doctors uh, who I've been working with on this quite a bit now to think through this device. Uh, but it, a few years ago, he implants it in the first human. Uh, the side effect of this device, I should tell you, uh, you have no pulse, you have no heartbeat, and you have no EKG. And Mr. Lewis, uh, who history often doesn't remember these patients, who I consider like our great explorers who've given their lives for other types of technology, like the Apollo program. Uh, Mr. Lewis was the first human in history who was alive in, on an operating table while every monitor in the room was a flatline. <clears throat> Again, it's, maybe this is the answer. <clears throat> and I want people to to live, and I want them, <clears throat> excuse me, I want science to enrich people's lives and give them healthy lives. But it's worth asking, at what cost? Is it okay? Do, should we not have a public conversation about what does it mean to let go of a defining feature of our humanity, which is, okay, maybe we can take a machine, <clears throat> but nobody thought the beating was also on the table as an as a, uh, extra that we could take off. So I want you to just think about that, because the work that I do is largely influenced by, by that. <clears throat> and on the other side of this, uh, Dr. Taylor uh, is arguing that that heart is probably, she doesn't think long term it's actually going to be the answer. Uh, because behind all of this is the problem of rejection, uh, which is what's motivating both these technologies. We can't, after all these years, we still can't quite figure out even in this kind of gesture of giving a heart, another heart to a human, your body immediately knows that's not me, and it does everything it can to destroy it. Dr. Taylor's next groundbreaking idea is, but what if we can just keep building your heart over and over? So when, if the day comes when you have heart problems and need a new heart, just put your own heart back in you, a, a healthy one that has been grown from your own stem cells. And as an artist, I'm fascinated by this visually, of course, but also structurally. Uh, and part of the work I'm doing with her, her and I'm trying to think through this, <clears throat> is this incredible image of the electron microscope image of the material of the ghost heart. And I, I guess I should back up. I, I'm assuming many of you may know what's going on here. But if you do, forgive me for just unwrapping it a little. But what Dr. Taylor has figured out is to take a cadaver heart, and she's literally washing it clean. Think of all the metaphorical meaning of the ability to wash your heart clean. Um, washing it clean of all cells. And all that's left behind is a term, I'm, again, many of you I'm sure know, the extracellular matrix. And it is the, I, I'm, partly investigating and, and arguing that has she found the fundamental form of the heart? Uh, and in the great history of, of philosophy and, and artists also in the pursuit looking for a fundamental form, I find it fascinating that in biology, where nobody was maybe looking for this point, that she had perhaps has and people who are working this field. So as an artist, when I look at this, I love the science, but I'm also seeing, is that somehow a fundamental form of life? And, it, and so I'm, trying, I'm developing some work based on that. And I love this comparison. Um, an, again, another very recent image we can take with uh, having enough data to finally make a model of the, large scale, the largest scale structure of the universe. And in fact, it's, it's quite webbed um, with these huge voids. That we're, you know, we're still trying to figure out why. But I love that at some basic level, there's this similarity of structure of, of life at the biggest and the smallest level. So that leads me to some of my own work on this, um, on this topic. And back to the point about signals. So 
In both those cases, the ghost heart and the beatless heart, the types of signals they will make, the, this image that we probably take for granted, I don't know if you've ever re even reflected on, the history of the pulse wave. One of the most iconic images in the history of image making, when we could convey life and death through the simplest of means, if everybody kind of knows that means life, everybody knows that means death. And in the history of images, this is profound, that you could convey something so deep with the most minimal information, visual information. But it set me off on a path to trace the history of our quest to record the signals of our hearts. And <clears throat> it's the beautiful history of technology, which I won't go into so much, but I wanted to show you, uh, after many years of research, I, my quest was could I find the first pulse wave and the first flat line ever recorded. The first time we had figured out how to convey the information of the heart outside the body without cutting into somebody, and which as I'm arguing have become iconic in the history of images. And here they are, uh, the first time, and just because I'm such a uh, interested, I'm so interested in materials, I just want to point out something quite beautiful about how these were made. But the medium of the era was uh, like a, not unlike a blood pressure device uh, to take the, pulse, the movement of the arterial wall or sound waves em emitting from the chest wall and convert that energy through a, a stylus into another medium that could form a fixed image. The problem that these scientists faced was nobody could figure out what kind of stylus to use or a medium to hold the image. And in one of our great lost stories of sensitivity, the scientist who finally figured out how to do this had the breakthrough of literally pulling a hair out of his head, cutting it down, and used this as the stylus. So his beating heart, the force of his heart, caused a little, his own little hair to bounce in unison. And he figured out how to take a piece of paper which had been uh, held over a flame, a candle flame, gathered the soot, and on a fixed mechanism, this darkened piece of paper is moving while his own hair is tracing an image of his heart in it. And so it's, it's remarkable to think the first time a human saw evidence of their own heart beating was traced by a single hair in a candle flame from 1853. And also this image, um, I mean, in the lineage of imaging death, which the arts have, have a long history of trying to do, <clears throat> this is an incredible moment to image death as one straight line. And they didn't quite know what to make of that. They didn't understand it at the time. It's since become iconic, as I'm, I was arguing. Anyway, I wanted, this project that I've been working on has been acquiring and tracing the history of these images. And what drove them early on was disease. The big question was, did disease look different? Nobody knew. Not only were they right, but they invented cardiology in the process once you could visually diagnose an in, the heart that was invisible in the body. But it's, again, it's also a beautiful history of images. And these early attempts are all about disease. And so part of my argument, the way I started today was, which I didn't quite say earlier on, is, is something I believe a lot too, is that if you put all that data on the table and you have a cardiologist, an engineer, an artist in the room, I want to make the case that we're, it's the same data and it's true, but we're going to find different pathways through it that I think reveal, we all are revealing something important to understand the full picture. And so I want to I wanna show you my, my uh, attempt to navigate this early information about the quest to image our hearts. So what I, something I started noticing uh, quickly, on, quickly was, I mean, I've looked through, I don't know, 10,000 images of disease at this point. It's just a, an atlas of disease, as my previous slide said. But something else odd was happening that I noticed. There were always these outlier recordings. 
that didn't seem to have anything to do with the main study of disease. But the scientists chose to put it there, or to record it first of all, but then chose to put, leave it in the manuscript or the book. And I started wondering why. And so for example, the first time a heart was recorded while somebody had a cold glass of water, or the first time a heart was recorded while somebody was smelling lavender, uh, or had a glass of wine, or had the hiccups, or went on a long walk in the countryside. This is the language the scientists were using to document it. And I think partly it's because this generation of scientists were trying very hard to pull the heart away from mystical religious thinking as far as its function and meaning. But of course, these were scientists who were very religious themselves, and it was still not entirely clear if the, the heart was not more than a, a complicated pump. Uh, you know, religion and art, as, and to this day, the lineage of that thinking is with us all the time. We have heart to hearts, we wear our hearts on our sleeves, uh, we give our hearts to each other. There's millennia of poetry written about the heart, not the lungs or the kidneys. And there's a reason. It's because the heart has meant something. And so I think these scientists were just not entirely sure. And for example, where were emotions in the body? Were they literally in the heart? And so the first uh, attempts at investigating emotions also occurred in the heart, uh, occurred in these images. Although they were never strictly, that was not what was said was happening as far as a, an investigation. It was still about disease. So I've been working on this project for many years. Here was, the, here was the quest I gave myself. Could I find the first time the heart was recorded from birth to death, just living its life? Not diseased, but just living its life. Just one waveform moving across decades, across different people, across different countries, that if I could piece them together, could I tell a snapshot of life? And I, I did a series of 50 prints, which I'll, I'll tell you more about how they're made, because it's, it's also honoring the soot printing technique. Uh, here's some installation images of the work. And it's all encased in this uh, portfolio, it's, I really, I wanted to make a, a book of life, uh, the very first images of the book of, of, the, of the heart. And so there's a track listing. Uh, this is, the, again, the language the physician used to document the study. There's an essay I wrote. And there are these uh, complicated prints I made using soot from a candle flame and the original tracing of the heart. But I want to just take you through a few of them. Uh, here's the iconic where the story begins, the first time someone could see their heart beating over time. But then other beautiful things, like the first time a heart was recorded while somebody was blowing a whistle in their ear, uh, or having a glass of hot milk, uh, what happens before and directly after it, or this beautiful one of smelling lavender. Uh, the first time a heart was recording smelling lavender. Um, the first time a heart was recorded uh, smoking marijuana. Uh, this, the, the language is just so beautiful. Not, of course, one of my favorite things in science is when uh, scientists are unintentionally poetic just by being incredibly specific. And I love reading this in a scientist's d uh, description, ear lightly touched with a feather while sleeping. And here we have evidence for the first time that was unlocking new, <clears throat> new knowledge about the body that the heart did respond even while you were sleeping, which opened the pathway to understanding uh, the nervous system in a new way. Uh, this, these two I want to spend a little more time telling you about, I'm very particularly interested in, is the first time life in utero was recorded. And, and just think of how common this knowledge is today of a mother having access to the sound or the image of their fetus. But wh who was the first mother who ever saw such a thing? And this image is, is just one of my favorite in the history of our quest to document life. And, what, and actually, it's very interesting what, what you're seeing, because at the time, nobody knew, did the mother's contractions have any bearing on the child? And it very clearly shows, um, you can see these, this is a mother having the contraction 
and then her heart stabilizes a bit. And her child immediately, the heartbeat changes in utero as well, and then starts to stabilize again when it does. This is so beautiful about understanding life through imagery. <clears throat> Here are two iconic images now that I'm arguing in the history of imaging death. But I want to spin, I just want to unpack this one the most because of all the 50 that I've found, this is the one that really, really impacts me the, the most uh, deeply and emotionally. And it's really beautiful for us to know this, the first time that we can learn something about ourselves, something that we all have in common. This is the first time a scientist <clears throat> with still brand new technology of imaging an interior, interior function, bio, biological function of the body had the foresight as the baby was born to ask the physician to not cut the umbilical cord and he placed his device directly on the umbilical cord. And this is the first tracing we have of, of this connection of life, mother and child. But, what, but when you dig in deeper what you're, what you're seeing and why I love the, com, the combination of <clears throat> imagery with, with uh, scientific knowledge, and you have that line, what can you learn? Here's what we learned on this day. If you notice these four very prominent beats, and then there's this odd, um, do I have a laser? Oh yeah, um, this odd little break here. And from that moment forward, it's slowly moving to a flat line. We didn't know this at the time, but this is what this image told us. This is the mother still oxygenating the baby. As you may know, of course, when, our, when we're in utero, our lungs have not inflated. We don't, we're not using them yet. The mother is still oxygenating the blood. And this is the last four beats of those two, of the mother doing that, which she's been doing for nine months. This is the baby taking its first independent breath and cry, initiating the inflation of its lungs. And at that moment, it's now sending hormones back through the umbilical cord to the mother to say, I got this. At this point, you will now harm me if you continue. And you're seeing uh, the slow flat line of their separation. And to me, it's <clears throat> so beautiful to think of two hearts in synchronicity, a heart newly independent, taking its first breath, and this slow goodbye to each other that will, of course, begin a new a new relationship, but it, it's, as far as I can find, no one's ever pointed this out or told that story. And that's why I partly argue why you need all of us in the room to sort through the data and tell it a little different way. Because to me, what, I'm, what I hope I've conveyed is as important as the engineer <clears throat> checking the device in the room uh, or the cardiologist who, who just needs to know the, pl the pressure, for example. That would be losing an important dimension to this information. But I want to <clears throat> take it one step further in the way I interact with this kind of inf data. And I want to tell you about my work across disciplines with uh, a colleague named Patrick Feaster, uh, a blossoming field called sound archaeology, which doesn't sound like it should make sense at first, which is what makes it so interesting to me. Uh, because are we correct in the sense that we have heard the earliest recordings of sound? And generally, that argument has been solved in the sense that everyone knows Edison made the first recording on this date in 1877. That initiated the, the history of our, our ability to record ourselves. Um, but is that true? Can we go back further? And what I want to point out is that in all of those images I just showed you, what my colleague and I argue is that they're also documents of sound. But they were made before the conceptualization of playable sound. But does that mean we can't still unlock what maybe is in them? So I want to tell you my, the, my friend has um, completely upended the our notions of how far back in time we can access sound. And he's done incredible work on this 
scientist, Edward Leon Scott de Martinville, who um, predates Edison by 20 years with his early sound recording device. It's remarkable the physiologists and acoustic scientists of this time are using very similar technology. Uh, he's shouting into this membrane. There's a little stylus hair, head here. Not, it's a uh, pig's, pig's hair. And this is a drum that also has soot-covered paper on it that he's turning as he's shouting into the membrane, leaving an image of his voice as a sound wave into the soot. This is with a tuning fork. But the key thing here is that this generation of scientists, the idea of hearing it again was not on the table. What they were curious was, did sound look different? And opened up a brand new field of, of research in the process, which one day would turn into cardiology. As far as imaging um, sound, so this is just a beautiful image of that. But my uh, colleague and Patrick and, and others that he's worked with have taken this further, arguing, can we find those original soot tracings? And is there still playable sound in them? I'm skipping over a lot of the technical stuff because I, I, for time. But I just want to show you, on, in 2008, if you don't know, I can't believe it was a decade ago now, but this whole category opened up as far as rethinking accessible sound. And Thank goodness Edward Leon Scott had properly packaged these soot tracings in an archive in Paris. And uh, in 2008, over a century later, they un were able to unpack them and embedded, oops, sorry. embedded in there is a, kind of a blow up of it, are the tiny vibrations of Edward Leon Scott's voice. After tons of work, as you can imagine, as far as writing the software of how do you play something without touching it. These are used, uh, incredibly high resolution scans were made. And of course, they didn't know the playback speed. They didn't even know what would be on there. And I want to play for you what came out of almost 150 year old soot. That's a scientist singing A Claire de la Lune, again in soot from 1857. This changes everything. And as someone who's interested in firsts, first ofs, as you're probably picking up on, uh, I now wanted to know what is the equivalent uh, territory that can be opened up with physiological recordings, internal physiological recordings, specifically the heart. So Patrick and I have been working on many of these to, to find, can we hear a heartbeat from the 19th century uh, embedded in soot from a candle flame? I've been working on many of these, but I just want to share one, one of the special ones that's highly relevant to the umbilical cord tracing that we've spent a lot of time working on. And as I was saying, you know, with modern technology, uh, the information we have as far as in imaging internal life in, in utero is not, you know, in particular, it's not very, um, it's magical, of course, to the mother, but the fact that we can do it is no longer quite magical. But in the grand arc of scientific history, we just learned how to do this. It's still incredible, so beautiful, incredible to me. And here, here is uh, a little heart in utero. And in the history of this field, that was a much more difficult problem, was, OK, finally, we, can, we cross the threshold of imaging a living human heart, a full adult heart. But it took another 50 years before we could image, I mean, uh, image and potentially hear that. It was such a level of magnitude of, of, of problem as far as more to a smaller sound, uh, and more uh, flesh to work through. But my uh, first thing was to find it. 
Where was the first attempt? And I want to bring your attention to this incredible device that you know, was on the dust heap of history as far as engineering devices, but it did something incredible. It was called a phonoscope. And the scientist who finally figured out how to record a fetal heartbeat, it's going to stretch your imagination as far as the fragility of materials, but it's true, just like the soot and the hair. But his breakthrough was to use what was at that time the most powerful microphone in a sense they could find, which was a bubble. Uh, he noticed that when he, a bubble on a table, as he talked across the room, it would vibrate. And so the challenge was, how do you utilize the sensitivity of a bubble to record a fetal heartbeat? And just to further unwrap the complexity of, of this device, he not only needed to harness the bubble as a conduit to take the fetal heartbeat vibration, he could get it to the bubble, but how do you take it further to a permanent waveform image? And so he came, another scientist had opened up this field of applying uh, molten glass or quartz to the end of a bow and arrow. Again, I know I'm going to stretch your, uh, cre the credibility here. This is very true. And he would shoot across his laboratory an arrow that has this molten glass on the end of it. And he would stretch the glass into these spider web-like strands. He then figured out how, just to give you a sense of that fragility, how to clip them, coat them with silver, uh, uh, very other, other materials. And then he fi <laughs> figured out how to, without bursting this bubble, which is held in the center, he would put this glass thread straight through that bubble. Uh, this funnel was applied to the device, the baby's heart beat in, it made the vo bubble vibrate. The sh shred of glass thread would then vibrate with it. Final, final point here. He's also using a brand new technology of photography. And as that waveform is vibrating through his device, He's also casting light into it to produce a shadow of the vibrating thread on a photographic plate that he's also pulling along a mechanism. And he produces the very first uh, image. It's called a phonogram, just to kind of give you an idea. But this is the first time uh, an infant's heart was recorded, again, with a bubble and spider web-like thin strands of glass. It just tests. It, I, I mean, I hope you just get that. That's amazing. Um, you know, what the Hubble does and the Kepler telescope, it, we this history of the sensitivity of observation and the materials needed to do it. So I want to play for you now with the work I've been doing for Patrick and those, the history of those images I just told you about. Can we, can we find the, another level of humanity in them? Can we hear them again? And so this is the recording we've been able to pull out of this. Uh, the first time a fetal harpy was recorded in 1908 by a soap bubble. It's really... Uh, a milestone we should all remember. And again, my argument is that I think you needed an artist to have asked that set of questions and then to have pursued getting that information out of it, along with all the other great information that came with it. They'd also opened up uh, fetal cardiology as a new field of study just by doing that. So I think I'm going to have to cut off my final stage of the talk just so we have a, to be sensitive to your time, but also to allow for a few questions. Uh, if, you have, if, if you wanted to know a little more, please prompt me on this next. Um, the way I was going to wrap up was with the signals of life. But why don't we have a few questions, um, and we'll just see how it goes. I also know you probably have class soon. I know Malcolm has to go. Yep, thank you. Yeah.
Are there any questions? No? Uh, for the sound archaeology, have you know, have you know that I think in the ancient time it was not sometimes not as artificial. The sound was recorded not as artificial. It was by natural phenomena. Like it was something like magnetic, and then they were writing, and then people make make a sound, and the, their voices were recorded. So somewhere uh, after that, and, and another like in this sound gets replaced, so people would say this was haunting actually the people would, this, this the natural phenomenon natural phenomenon just making like a magnetic recorder. So is that also a topic of so called sound archaeology? I uh, I don't think so because you know to be a strictly de a definition of sound it's you know the vibration of air molecules through space. The magnetic field I think is what you're asking. Uh, although that, as far as how that relates to internal physiological process, I don't think that predates uh, this attempt here. Like the first image of the electrical map of the heart was uh, right around this time as well. So you can certainly audibilize anything nowadays, but my colleague and I, Patrick, are kind of sticklers to that the original recording was made by sound waves through space uh, rather than uh, electrical or magnetic. I think, I hope I'm answering your question. Uh, but, it, but it's not that you can't audibilize those, audibilize those in an interesting way and maybe reveal something in that process too. Definitely you can. Um, well, any other questions? Malcolm? I, I really enjoyed your observation Oh, that's such a great question. Um, yes, well, so, you know, we, we would, argue, I think everybody would agree we're in a craniocentric era <laughs> on these types of questions, but historically speaking, the huge bulk of that conversation was the heart, the cardiocentric, in the sense that the heart was not a metaphorical conduit between the immaterial and material realms. It was considered the literal site of one's soul. It was how, uh, you know, something metaphysical that we couldn't really physically explain, of course, somehow had a bearing on the physical world was through the heart. So although we, we've, I, would, I, I don't know how many of you would still subscribe to that or not. I always like to sort of push people sometimes and ask them, you know, push comes to shove, where do you think you are in your body? in the sense that that matters culturally. Like, like I said, we give our hearts to each other, not our kidneys in a romantic sense. Um, and there's, there's a reason, and it's because the, a lot of thinking is because the heart is the only organ we're physically aware of. Uh, early hunters and gatherers would have probably quickly put two and two together that the pulsatility and temperature of that organ had a direct link to life and death. Uh, so there, there's interesting thinking about why the heart has held its importance often across time and culture. Modern Western science, of course, you know, raised that the heart is a complicated pump and anything I'm saying as an artist is quite over romanticizing the problem. And so that conversation's moved to the brain where, of course, the questions of consciousness come up. <laughs> and so Although I'm a student of the history of that, of that question of where do we locate ourselves in our body, uh, I would argue, I'm, I'm, I know you know this too well, Malcolm, but that seems to be where the conversation is now and the varying, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't think, we, we still don't have a sort of consensus working definition of consciousness. You know, there are many different points of views on this. Uh, and nobody can quite figure out why that collection of atoms, you put them in that configuration, why should self-awareness arise out of them when no other configuration of molecules and atoms does that? Uh, 
And as long as we have that big question out, I think inevitably the, the, what you're asking seeps in. I don't, I don't know by scientists or not, although you may know a better overview of that field. For example, a line of thinking that would argue we can't ever know what consciousness is. And so, and there may be many scientists who subscribe to that, but then of course, what are they saying? That it's essentially non-immaterial or outside physical reality? So then maybe you get into that weird jerky territory. I don't, I don't know. Do, do you want to elaborate at all on that? <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 uh, I, my, I, at least where I stand now, I don't see any reason why we can't physically explain it one day. So I'm still sort of in that camp. <laughs> um, as an artist, I, I love metaphor. I love the power of symbolism. I love the territory I'm allowed to explore in. But as an artist, I'm still firmly rooted in and the physical sciences. And even my interest in aesthetic experience and art often lies in uh, you know, the, the neurology of what allows for an aesthetic experience or even the behavioral history of creativity is a field that I'm also very interested in. Uh, why did this behavior to make something rather than to not make it and to have hopefully it embodies other meaning and purpose why should that arise, again, from this collection of atoms is a profound question to me. It's, a, you know, it's, like, it's like the question of the consciousness, but I just, it's like maybe a subdivision of the question of aesthetic experience. Also, as a unique factor of this collection of molecules. So as I started out my talk, as an artist, I feel my obligation is to, to explore that as much as uh, the nature of a material, or nature of a form, or nature of an image. I want to know all of it. <laughs> and that may be impossible, but I want to uh, contribute to that knowledge in some, some way. So how about one more question? I'll, uh, very great and big questions. Um, so I'm gonna I maybe fall into a cliche a little bit here, and, I, and I'm always hesitant to do that because I like to be surprised by people. Uh, but just for the sake of beginning to answer you, you know, we have these conceptions about engineering and art that they're not that they're incompatible at some fundamental level because of methodology or uh, the expect, what success looks like, what's the expected outcome of, of the investigation. So there's that, and you know, so there's also the sort of stereotype that an artist is more flighty, more emotion or instinct driven, rather than reason, rational, uh, rationality of science or engineering. And I've never bought into that, although I understand the distinctions. I just don't, I've, my brain has never allowed me to pick one or the other. I just, I want both. Like I want, I want the most poetic, romantic metaphor in the world and I want it based in physical reality. And I, and I want them both. And I, find, and I find that, like I said, I don't know that I can understand either unless I fold in the knowledge of the other to the field. So. I don't know if, you, if your definition of the two differs or not, but the, I'm being sort of big picture what we would probably think our differences are. Are you, are you an engineer? Yeah. Okay. So do you, have, do you have anything you would add to those kinds of uh, broad sweet swipes of what we are? Great. 
Well, let me, let me throw this back to you. Do you think being an engineer to anybody is uncreative? Like, do you ever, in your work, do you ever, is the word creativity, uh, creativity applicable to any part of the process of what you're doing? Is that the right word you would use? Yeah, I think it's the word mm. creativity. You do? Yeah. yeah. What, do others agree that creativity is a correct word for some of the process of what you do? Right, and, and I, so I, I buy into that totally. Um, but you know, perception, public, public perception though, I think these are true. And I worry that as thinkers in the world that we buy into those cliches. Like I don't know if you discuss to each other the creativity inherent to what you do or the language you're given in your field sort of always pushes you a little away from that kind of language, talking about, I, I don't know. In my experience talking to many engineers, they uh, tend to not speak about their work the way, the way I do. Although when I look at the work, like the beatless heart or the ghost heart, that is an incredible leap, a creative leap in thinking, to think that we can let go of the pulse or build a heart, a ghost heart of what we once were. That is one of the most beautiful, profound, poetic things I've ever encountered, that ghost heart in particular. And like Carl Sagan would argue, like I, I started, like how can you look into the cosmos and not also feel these other feelings, the sense of creativity, that those are the right words. So I want to be hard on myself and you in the sense that as an artist, I want some accountability into physical reality when I'm working. I don't want it to just be whatever I can, although I support artists who want to go down that path, that's fine. Uh, but I like the extra challenge of having some of your criteria on what I'm doing, and then vice versa. I would throw back the same to you. And I hope I've made a case that it doesn't need to just be lip service because there's actually a reason to do it. That you may go down a path you would not have gone down otherwise. I certainly have in my own work. Uh, you know, like investigating a beatless heart led me to, to those, to uncovering the sound of a, of a fetal heartbeat from 1908. I don't know that I would have ever arrived there without that initial engineering, uh, initial interest in the engineering of the beatless heart. Uh, so I hope, I hope you will be more conscious of the cliches that we're kind of forced into in our fields. And as inquisitive, curious people, poke at that as much as you would be poking at whatever you're working on. Uh, I'm just constantly questioning. In fact, as soon as I hear somebody tell me something, maybe the contrarian in me just immediately goes to what's the other the other part of this, or what, what's the opposite argument to it. Just instinctual to think that way. Um, so, but to learn about art, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big challenge. Uh, Susie, well, why don't, maybe you can help me. Uh, uh, how, how would you recommend someone um, start?
It's a great, I mean, not to put you on the spot, but I am curious how many of you have been to the block? Oh, that's great. That's good, Susie, yeah. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. And maybe just the last little thing to add in, in, into that, onto that point is the way I understand art is it's a form of knowledge production in the world, just like other fields. And I don't know that the, and it, you know, again, I'm being broad stroke here, but publicly, I don't know that one would immediately think of art as a pursuit of knowledge and a contributor to knowledge in the world in the same way we would think of science or engineering or math. But I want to challenge you that it really is. And especially when you look at the lineage of it, like I mentioned on the cave walls, these were early investigations into making sense of the world around, around them. And the visual, using the visual uh, to do that, and perhaps invest it with meaning, of course, which is what art is ho hoping for. And, and I, so every time I go into my studio, I deeply feel connected to the first cave painting. I'm, I'm somehow part of the ripple out effect of that first gesture. And although it was a gesture perhaps to find beauty, it was also a gesture of curiosity about the world around you. And so there is a knowledge base in the arts to look at in the way you may think of, of science or engineering as a way of investigating the world. So thank you all for coming, and I, I hope some of this will impact your own thinking. Thank you.